unleash John. Uh, one or two words about, I think, the guy that also became a good friend in a way. <laughs> because uh, I'm John Malone and I'm part of the Ox. And uh, I've, I've been uh, involved with the Ox my whole life. Um, not in minerals, like John, he studied at UCT. And uh, he has been in minerals and mineral commodities for 40, 45 odd years of his life. Um, whether that was in gold, uranium, and ending up uh, with the platinum groups and and copper and and even even diamonds, right. I believe. And John has uh, worked uh, Southern Africa, yeah, up in the Americas, and uh, but in Australia, I believe, yeah. and 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 in. Uh, we're not going to tell him about Russia. Keep that <laughs> one quiet for me now. But John, um, all the best for your talk. Thank you. And it's, it's good that you share something I've got a passion about okay. with us as well. Okay. Right. We're here to enjoy you. Okay, go. Okay. No. Right, let's try again. Uh, always new technology, different doesn't work, but uh, anyway. Um, this I've had a house at Nature's Valley for over 40 years. And <laughs> strangely enough, the scenery was always just an important part of it. Okay? But it never really clicked with me what it, what it meant at all until I moved down to Amanus and I started to hear about sea level change and seeing different evidence of sea level change. And um, it was when you're working up in the middle of Africa and Southern Africa where everything's flat, the sea level is not relevant until you come down to Nature's Valley. But then it was all the scenery, you see these things, what is that? So I, I did promise earlier this year when I, I ran into the new director of Nature's Valley Trust, and he said, oh, you're a geologist, you must come and talk about the rocks of Nature's Valley. Well, somebody had asked me that 40 years before, and I said, oh, okay. So here we are. And I think it's quite interesting to bring in the basic geology, which is relatively simple, uh, to bring in what's happened in the last... Uh, in the last uh, about 20 million years to show it really was what builds the scenery. Next. So we'll look at location, where is nature's valley, the geological ages for those people who are not geologists. So I might just look through that a bit. Uh, the position in time um, and, South, of, and South African stratigraphy of nature's valley. Where did they form? What they made up of? The two main groups, the Table Mountain group and the Bokkal group, which you've probably all heard of. And then we'll go into the first, uh, we're going to look at the Tsitsikama Terrace, which is one of the most uh, obvious features of that part of the countryside or the coastline. We'll then move into the sea level change. Then what you actually see at Blue Rocks and at Salt River, which if you know Nature's Valley are two of the, the sort of iconic locations. And then what did Nature's Valley look like during the Holocene High Stad, which is very recent. Um, and then what, the, what I understand of the geology today. Time for questions. Okay, the next one. So the interesting thing about the location of Nature's Valley, you can see it marked there NV. It's at a, a little sandy beach, about two kilometers long, wedged between Plettenberg Bay on the left with the longer beach and the well-known blow points uh, on the right there. Um, and then you've got this, this relatively flat terrain that goes up from sea level to to about 200 meters and then slopes very gently up towards that yellow dotted line, which has been identified as a Miocene sea cliff. Uh, work was done in this area by uh, students from the University of Port Elizabeth or Nelson Mandela now, which, which really was a topographic study of the whole Southern Cape coastline. So you've got those rugged high mountains in the north, reaching a peak there at Formosa of 1675 meters. And then a precipitous sea cliffs to the south, and in between you've got this almost level plain. Now this plain is the Miocene Terrace cut when the area was submerged below sea level between 5.3 and 23 million years ago. And that's kind of the broad age. And when you look at the type of rocks there, not surprising it could take that long to carve into that. When you drive along that, you come across places where you see boulder beds in the cuttings, uh, in, the, in the sandstones, mm -hmm. going across low crons, going across and Stardens particularly, you see the boulder bed, beautiful rounded quartzite bell above. And that's the evidence of that sea level, usually probably retreating phase as it's rolling the rubble back. 
Next. So just in terms of geological time scales, on the left is, is kind of a generic time scale that just goes the length of time that, that has happened. And I've identified where our rocks sit within that. And on the right is a, is a, a, a cartoon of, of the South African portion of that whole strategic. Um, and then on the left, I've marked there where the Cape Supergroup sits, which are the rocks that form the base of, of what we're going to be looking at. I've shown the Karoo in there, which relates to the image on the right. And then the Yutene group, which is, the, which is mostly offshore material uh, and some onshore material, which is the younger one. And then there's all these gaps in between. We have the Tissikama platform there um, up, at, up at least uh, at most of our 20 odd million years ago. Next. So we've heard about the formation of the Agala Sea um, that uh, in, the, in the, the sort of latter stages of Gondwana, um, there was a supercontinent comprised of bits of Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, Madagascar, and India that were assembled by tectonic forces uh, in the Pan African, and then once again started to rift. And that's a continuing process of plate tectonics coming together, pulling apart. But in fact, the, the Agala Sea was not a full rift like the Atlantic. It never exposed uh, um, an, an ocean basalt. And if you go to the next one, this was pulled apart. Uh, it was filled with sediments, sandstones, and, and mudstones of the of the of the uh, Table Mountain group, of the Cape Super Group. Next one, and then eventually you turned around, and that's what happens. They pull apart and they turned around. There was a Paleo Pacific off to the west, and this was starting to push South America back, and the Falklands Plateau, which was attached and and form a subduction zone on on the western side there, which is is the right and case or south and bottom is better. Next. The, up came the Cape uh, Fold Mountains as we know them. Uh, but in fact, shortly after that, it was truncated. Next. And what we have now, so those mountains were cut off halfway through. The other half went off on the other side of the Atlantic. And, uh, and uh, we're left with this side, which is really these uh, these beautiful white sandstones and mudstones uh, leading into the Karoo Basin on the, on the left hand side, left hand side. And these, these are the sort of iconic mountain scenery that you see all around the Cape. Next. So what's the environment in which the Cape Supergroup was deposited? It's a, it's a, it's a fairly long linear belt. And what's preserved uh, in Southern Africa is about 1200 kilometers of the coastline that extends up to 400 kilometers inland. And that's been determined by boreholes drilled all the way up to beyond Beaufort West. Mostly they were done in the search for oil and they've intersected, intersected uh, Cape Supergroup sandstones, which is the lower part of the Table Mountain Group, um, as far inland as that. And in fact, even, even uh, Mike DeWitt reported that in the Salpeterkop volcano, um, near Sutherland, uh, he found cobbles, boulders, fragments that he believes were, were Cape Supergroup. So, so there's, there's lots of evidence, uh, and those were brought up 70 million years ago. So the stuff is all down there. So basically only the shallow marine environment is exposed in the Cape Cold Belt Bay. There's the sandstones, and then overlying that, the Bookerfeld mudstones next. So we're basically in the, in the Cape Mountain Group concerned with the lowermost units, the you know, geology is full of names. There's names for everything. It doesn't matter whether they're the individual fragments or the big units and, and bigger units and so on. There are lots of names. It generally relates to the, to the type location or the original place over described. So those, these slides, so a lot of detail, they give a lot of information on, on what, the, what it's composed of. And those lower parts, the Table Mountain Group is sandstone, predominantly sandstone, and many of them very clean white sandstones that you see around. Next. The depositional environment um, has been debated quite a lot. These sort of clean sandstones are relatively rare, but they generally form these huge white, these huge bodies worldwide. And it's been a, it's been described now. And don't forget that that back 500 million years ago, there was no vegetation. There were no living plants as we know them. There may have been algae and things. And, they, they, and because of the location of Gondwana at that time, actually quite far south, 
relatively close to the pole, south of 60 degrees south. But in fact, it was an icy windswept environment. There were glaciers to the north, which eventually formed the Pacos uh, Tillite uh, Diamectite. And that's evidence of a glacial period right in the middle of the Table Mountain Super, or the Table Mountain Group. So that uh, picture on the left, which is actually of Iceland, which is black sand, but shows the type of distribution or depositional environment. And on the right is Nature's Valley. So if you can ignore the greenery, uh, the, the white sandy beach is probably what was being uh, deposited in those days back uh, 300 odd million years ago. Next. You get abundant uh, cross bedded sandstones, plain bedded sandstones. We've seen them all uh, up in the, in the mountains here. Um, they're probably mostly uh, mostly uh, marine or uh, sort of sh near shore environments. They're very clean sands. A lot of the very fine clay particulate matter has been washed out. But strangely enough, uh, even this uh, gr a grotto beach is a cutting there as you go down to Dutchies of mud flakes in the sandstone, in the cross beds, quite mixed with, with quartz pebbles. So uh, I find that like a strange environment, it's the reworking of things. At the top is an image of cross bedded uh, windblown sands uh, near the kelms, to give you some idea of what the feature looks like. But mostly the Table Mountain group is, is, uh, is water laid, and, and many of these cross beds were probably advancing large dune ripples on the floor, on a shallow floor, much like Walker Bay. Next. In the middle there, you have this Pacos uh, diamectite, um, which is described as probably being the outwash edge from the glacial front, which is lying to the north. And uh, what we see, uh, for example, at Ospan, near, near Betis Bay, is this, this uh, uh, unsorted pebbly sand with, uh, with, strange enough, some interesting sandstone dikes in it, which they relate to freezing and swelling and and movements of really soft, soggy water, water, uh, water uh, sodden sediments into into other more more, more uh, uh, laminated and sorry more consolidated sediments. All the fascinating story. And then you went back into a, into a, into the white sandy beaches, going up into the uh, Cardini and the and the uh, what's it called? The Skirvenberg, which actually forms the the back of the Mons with white sandstones. Next. So the Bocca felt, which uh, uh, over, overlies and, and partly in juxtaposition to the Table Mountain group, was a, a fine grained shale or mudstone shale, as many people misconstrued. Shale is not a rock, it's a texture. They're basically mudstones and less of sandstone, but they are they are the first explosion of life into the, into the Cape uh, supergroup. And, and this is one of the early evidences of a sudden abundance of growth of life after a glacial event. And it seems that some, it might be connected to that sudden influx of, of fine grained material from the glaciers into the, um, into the environment in which microbes are already li living, which start to develop these early primitive organisms. And we have evidence around here of the trace fossils of some of these, these creatures. Some of them are worms, which we have down here, at Tamati Bunk and, uh, and across the, at Claymont, there's some beautiful exposure there. And we have a sample of that in the garden at Carol Porter. And then up in the mountains above um, uh, Pringle Bay, somebody discovered the amazing uh, tracks from a huge, probably a water scorpion, which was probably about this big, but these amazing tracks of this eight legged thing that was crawling across this, this fine sandy floor. And that's beautifully preserved. Next. And then you go up into, so this is now the Bockefeld group, and the, the section that we're mainly con, con, concerned with is the Cato formation right at the bottom. This is in nature's value. And, uh, and that's just a mudstone, which is now a shale from, from tectonic uh, uh, effects. And above that, the Witterberg group, which is uh, a lot of sandstone as well. But the Bockefeld group is a, a thick uh, sequence of alternating mudstones and sandstones and siltstones and beautifully explained in the Cedarburg as you go up from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from south to north in the beautiful hills there. And, uh, Cameron Penn Clark at the Council for Geoscience has done a magnificent job of documenting that and documenting the, the fossils, which are indications of the change of life 
and the and the impact of the environment. Next. So we get to Sisikama, and funny enough, I, I stayed in the Breakwater Lodge uh, some years back, and there, right in the hallway, was this was this this, this photograph of a painting, um, which now it was that coastline was represented in 1792 as a sketch. And it recognizes dramatic topographic difference between the Longenberg Mountains and the Sisikama, which is that Miocene platform. But interestingly, you can see the uh, Bettenberg Bay, and I've got a, a sign there on the right that says, you know, I think that's the Krutrafia, that's the river there, and maybe it's Botrans to the right. Miocene is to the left. Uh, interesting, the rivers that are shown, they're all, all flowing west, which is not as we know them today, but they all flow east. Just interesting depictions from a, from travellers uh, trying to get a perspective from height to produce a map. I think it's fascinating. Next, but today this is an excerpt of the current geological map. It's been blown up a bit. You see Nature's Valley in the middle. Um, there's a there's a fault that runs through the coastline at Nature's Valley, and that's part of the story as to why um, the particular rocks are exposed there. So the you, you, the sequence that you see there. Right up against the coastline on the left, going towards uh, Kielbuns, uh, you've got sandstones, and they form quite a prominent uh, ridge. And along that coastline at Kielbuns, you can see them. They form these beautiful slabs sticking out of the sea. And as you go around towards Salt River, you come into the into the Cado shales and silt, and 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 uh, many of them are phyllites have been so formed. And the symbol there shows a steeply overturned. Sinform, so the, the Kadar shales are preserved in that. And then you go into sandstones again of the Table Mountain group. The Pakais is not represented in that area, uh, although they, they may be some part of, the, of, the, uh, of it along where the N2 runs. I haven't seen it, but uh, theoretically that's where it is. The N2 is shown dark there. Now, that Miocene sea cliff is actually very easily found. And we spotted it when we did the Tsitsi Kama hike a couple of years ago. And that photograph on the right, uh, with the arrows pointing its location, is a beautiful waterfall coming down that sea cliff. So it's very, very clear to see. You can see that. So that's an early representation of sea level at that time. The story about how it gets there is always up for debate, but I have my ideas coming later on. Next, please. So a, a cross section. Now I, I must uh, thank the the author of that topographic study for this lovely simplified section. Uh, if you, sorry, if you could go back maybe just to the previous one, you see the section line uh, mm. southwest northeast from from Arch Rock at Kilbums uh, to Formosa. Next, and that's uh, that really ideally shows a, a beautifully relatively flat plane up against the sea cliff. Um, I've put in the geology, the underlying geology, and you can see the incised valleys of the Protrophia and the Sotrophia. And with two levels, there's the Miocene platform and then a Pliocene bench closer towards the sea. And those, uh, those seem to be relative, uh, relative positions uh, that could make sense in the story. So, so what would be the cause of the marine terrace formation? We've got sea level changes due to ice ages, that as you know, when there's lots of ice formed, sea level drops, and it would be eroding and making a platform, and then sea level rises as it melts, and they bury it buries that. But if you have things like isostatic rebound, and I believe that's the case here, that as Gondwana was separating, that in fact the African continent we know rose up because it's relatively light, it's got a genetic core, and it rose up, and um, after this period of erosion, was still rising and probably still is. This this uh, coastal plain was exposed and it's very well exposed and described along long areas of the, South Africa, of the east coast of South Africa. Because in fact, southern Africa is also tilted, so it's up in the right and, and, and down on, on the west. And so there you can see the tight structures in the in the, uh, in the sediments underneath. Next. Now this is a this is a, 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 a steel from one of the posters along the coastline here. This kind of, this one is currently at uh, at Sivas Pint, but it's actually you turn it ninety degrees and it shows the sea level changes at uh, 
in a different orientation. I put it this way because sea level goes up and down. It doesn't go to the right. <laughs> and my interpretation of that is that uh, in the middle there, you've got sea level at the, during the time of breakup of Gondwana, which is about relatively 300 meters above current sea level. And that uh, you had, after that, a continuum cycle of uplift and erosion, uh, forming that Afri so called African erosional cycle all the way through to about, uh, well, to the Miocene, but first 30, the first 65, 65 million years when you had a, a still stand, which is the, the African erosion cycle and well represented around here towards, uh, towards Riversdale with these little plateaus. And John has done a lot of work on, on that. Work. So that's a representation of the amount of sea level change that has been. And you see particularly in the last 23 million years, as perhaps the, the, uh, the, the sort of natural uplift has actually subsided and we're getting more the effect of glacial effects. So it's far more regular, far more regular. And this is something being identified in many studies, uh, particularly in the last two and a half million years, that uh, the glacial events of freezing, sea level lowering, melting, sea level rising is, is a common feature. Next. So what do we see at Nature's Valley? What's the evidence of sea level change? When you're at Blue Rocks, which is on the western side, one of the striking features you see looking there to, uh, to the east towards Blochrans, and it's this from the forest, are these relatively level plains. Um, the top one is labeled B, it's not my labeling, that was the original author, which is Tsitsikama Marine Terrace, about 150 meters at the coast. To about 260 meters inland on the, at the Miocene Sea. Then below this, when you have Nature's Valley, the level that forms the points uh, to the to the east of, of, of the Crotophere, um, and then up there to a little little feature called Pig's Head, is in fact the I believe the Pliocene terrace, as it was retreating and cut into that. So there's another period of still stand, but the erosional period. There's nice evidence which I'll show you at, uh, at Pig's Head as to why I believe there was a marine terrace. Um, and the interesting thing is that this is well preserved inland because as we saw from the, as you might see just now, that in fact, there was an embayment of Bockefeld Shale in the Nature's Valley area. And that made it very erosional. So that's how the Nature's Valley formed, why that's preserved where everywhere else, they don't get a lot in the way of sandy beaches. And then right at the bottom, number C, is the Holocene High Stand. The Blue Rocks there is a very level, plain north feature. It's, it's very dissected by these very sharp, dark blue uh, rocks. And people say, how did they form? And that's part of the story. But in fact, they've all been planed off. And that's the, that's the I believe, to be the Holocene High Stand, about three probably three to five meters, and that occurred only four to five thousand years ago. Next. So just going back to look at the scenery around about, um, what I'm left is, is, a, is a view at the level of the, of the Miocene Terrace, the short periphery up above, and you can see it's a relatively low, low, uh, relatively level plain. It's quite dramatic when you drive along there. So that's uh, the top of the group if you have passed through the crags. Then on top of Pig's Head, which I only discovered relatively recently, it's a bit of a tricky climb up there, you've got this pebble conglomerate, a small pebble conglomerate, which is, uh, which is are cemented into the top of that little feature, and which I believe are remnants of the, of the Pliocene tips. Next slide. And then for the, for the Holocene, uh, if you get down at, at the level of the Crotophere Lagoon, you can see the Pliocene Terrace B, uh, the Miocene Terrace is above you to the left there. Um, and right there, if you sit there, and if, in fact, uh, recently it's been very exposed at the mouth, and there are these really strange, rugged, jagged rocks there with a very dark, iron rich crust on And if you sit back, and there's a level that comes from out on the, at the point all the way into the valley. And, and I believe that represents at the mouth there the level of the Holocene High Stand. And then you go up the valley towards the, the rest camp, the first of your rest camp, and you get these unsorted conglomerate beds in, in the road cutting there. And I think they're evidence of what was going on in that valley 
during that high stand. So these are these are these have been uh, left behind when when water levels were somewhat high. Next. So what happened with the sea level? Now, Hayley Cawthra at the Council of Geoscience has done magnificent work with her team in mapping the Agullas Bank, and there's a, there's a spectacular sequence of publications on the whole, the whole um, environment, uh, environmental regimen on the Agullas Bank, that it was actually a plain, um, and 140,000 years ago, it was way out of the Agullas Bank, and that area was, was roamed by animals, elephant, hippopotamus, various types of antelope, and it was also the early stages of human development. They the evidence we have is in later periods, 70 to 90,000 years ago, in the Middle Stone Age, in those famous caves around the coast. The Kelders, Lombos, Clinical Point, there's evidence there of what these, where, what sort of uh, food these people forage, and there's bones in these things where they can, these are animals that no longer exist, but they're related to the ones that used to wander that plain. And, then, and certainly around Walker Bay, there's, there's uh, uh, certainly considerable um, thought that those were early representations of the Cape Fainals used to spread out over that plain. Next. So this is a more detailed uh, uh, look at, at sea level change in the last 200,000 years. And there at about 140,000 years, the last full uh, uh, deep glacier where most of the, the, the earth was really covered in ice north and south and dropped sea level way down, 140 meters. And, uh, and then, as you can see, it rises quite fast. As soon as things start to change, things rise quite fast. It overshoots, goes above, comes down, another little ice age, many ice ages, interglacials, and then down to the last glacial maximum only 20,000 years ago when water sea level dropped way back down again. So all of those early exposed plains would have been exposed, flooded, exposed, flooded. And one doesn't know how long it takes for the vegetation, everything to resuscitate. But uh, a lot of the work that Haley's been doing is been trying to map that and to see where we might see evidence of those earlier uh, fires. Next. So sea level change. You know, there's, this is, there's this paradigm. The sea level change is a certain consequence of global warming. Um, but ice age cycles in the past 900,000 years have seen sea level fluctuations between minus 130 and plus 80. <laughs> this is Haley calls this work. The present melt back of all remaining ice on Earth to create between 58 and 65 meters of sea level rise. That's quite a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. This is unlikely to help to occur as the last time was in the late Cretaceous 65 million years ago when continental configurations were different as a result of plate tectonics. The ocean currents were not established, wind systems were different, and the, Melan the mysterious Milankovitch cycles were not set in place. You know, this is, this is science. So based on the study of past fluctuations from the geological perspective, that perhaps in the next 200 years, that's how accurate we are, global sea level could be expected to rise as much as between 0.9 and 1.8 meters and 11 meters above present in the next 40,000 years. Now that's Haley's work on studying how it's changed. So these are some. So I think we're okay here. Uh, I think we're okay. Well, some of us have a lovely seafront. <laughs> but this is a natural process, and although human impact may enhance or accelerate the rate of rise, climate change and sea level change is largely a natural process. Next. So these molecular cycles, when you look at it, there's, there's at least four major cycles that affect the, the basically the, the impact of the sun on the earth. And you can read this in many places, and uh, it goes from the from the hundred thousand year cycles of the Earth's elliptical orbit through the forty one year cycle of the of the Earth's axial wobble, to the twenty one thousand year cycle of the combined tilt in the elliptical orbit, that's the precession of the equinoxes, and then even the year and six two hundred and six year cycle of sunspot activity. So you can imagine you could get a real perfect storm. That would just melt everything where there's ice, and uh, and we really would be in trouble. 
but these things, they don't happen in the past. And I don't think we need to worry about them affecting us. We need to worry more mostly about the rubbish in our life. <laughs> so at Blue Rocks, this is the place where it all started. You know, what, what does these rocks at Blue Rocks? And most obviously there are these, these, these very level surfaces. Uh, at the top there is the Pliocene Terrace. In the background, you can see the Miocene Terrace with the Pliocene below. And at Blue Rocks is the Holocene High Stand Terrace. But you also have a current terrace eroding. And there's a, a well-developed notch. In fact, there are two notches, uh, which are two different stages where the sea has been washing and they're washing. And these rocks are very facile. They break up easily. They're probably being quite easy to erode. Next. So people say, why, why do they look like this? Well, in fact, this is not at, nature, at Blue Rocks, but it gives an example of, of how cleavage forms in, in these rocks. And when you take a, a fine-grained rock and you bend it, you get a, a planar foliation parallel to the, to the actual planes, which breaks the rock up as the minerals are compressed and change orientation. It gets a very facile uh, texture and... Um, you see some, at nature's value, you look hard, you see some evidence of original bedding, but it's not easy to see, but you see a lot of this cleavage and this, this uh, fine grain and very ragged uh, um, facility. You get a lot of faulting and you get quartz veins forming. Next. So when you're looking down from the lookout point, you look at, at, uh, at Sinker Bay, Darky Bay, it's been called inside, but you have very plumbing cleavages in that. You can see radiating in the cleavages. I've never got down to hogging them all, but I'm sure if you did, you'd see a range of, of foliations which, to which you could match and map the sink down and form. And, uh, and this bay, which, back when, and this bay, which, uh, which is, I always think, why do you suddenly have a bay there? And I think there must be faults running through there that have. Probably latterly, more in the time of Gondwana separation, that the town dropped a little pot there. There's probably another fault on the left there, which is sort of made exposed, allowed nature's only meat to develop, and then a quicker fair fault at the far side. Those sort of define the various uh, structural features of nature's valley. Next. And then Salt River, which is a very you know, iconic spot. It's, it's just so weird. and. Puzzled me as well. And really, you know, this, uh, this I stuck in almost like I was asking the thought, what is this? And I think what we're looking at there is a fault that runs back, comes across from, from Sinker Bay. And you see evidence of that fault on the left hand side of very brecciated rocks as you go back onto the path there. And, and the, the front uh, along this, this uh, inland of, of the shoreline there is a very linear feature that goes up towards Forest Hall. And you've got this narrow channel. And I think this, this possibly uh, is a, a ground Pleistocene river valley. Um, they found evidence in the, in, the, uh, in the Salt River from the uh, ecological work that's been done in recent years of, of, of insects uh, living in the water there that have not been known since the Jurassic. That it's a little captured, it's a very short drainage system. And they're doing a lot of work now to try and really protect this because, of course, it drains the whole of the Kerland Township, uh, brick factory, and forest sea land. So the catchment is very short, but it's very, it seems to be a very significant ecological niche. Um, yeah, okay, so during the Holocene high sand, there you had the, the same geology with the, the sandstones on the left dipping. Relatively shallowly uh, inland, you've got the over, overturned syncline of the of the Kralo formation, and then you go back into sandstones again. So Nature's Valley is cut into those softer Bockerfeld shales as far back as the current cliff edge, which forms just behind Nature's Valley and basically forms the northern boundary of Nature's Valley. And this is evidenced, I believe, in, in remnant conglomerates um, uh, at the back at the bottom of the cryptography of Pass and on the road to the campsite. Uh, next one. There you can see on the left, there's, 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 there's two sandstones that, that could be old beach river deposits, maybe sandbars in the river. You get these unsorted conglomerates. Uh, so I think they're all part of an, a higher level of the river 
when the when during that policy high stand. Next. So during the high stand, uh, this is these are the features that develop. You've got these uh, you've got the, the erosional cutback to the back of Nature's Valley. Um, that's the Nature's Valley embayment. Those those streams that currently still run through Nature's Valley were probably paleo streams as well. Um, that cut down into those uh, sediments. Um, you've got the uh, you've got the Pig's Head Marine Terrace on the right. And you've got Holocene High Stand Terraces on the right of the Crookshire Mouth and the Blue Rocks. And you've got the sandbar and conglomerates marked in yellow on the base of the end of the Crookshire Pass and up the valley there. Next. So in 2008, there was, there was quite a panic about sewage in Nature's Valley, and they did quite a lot of drilling. In fact, one of the geologists who knows many, Francois Wagner, he had Anglo Youth retired, yeah, he undertook the goal of bogging these things and everything. And I'm unfortunately not being able to recover those, but, but the maps exist of, of what the interpretation was related to developing its, of a sewage disposal plan. So there were issues with infiltration, and there are places where, where um, septic tanks just do not filter and it all runs into the drainage, and there are problems with the coli and the lagoon and all the rest. So they mapped this out. Um, that there's a band of clay up against the surface at the back, and the rest is predominantly sand. But in there, they can identify that there's actually a, a clay ridge or a shale ridge in between the clay and, and these fossil dunes. And they have two fossil dunes, and then you come to the, uh, come to the modern um, beach cordon sand dunes. Next. So that's a, a section. Now, just, just bear in mind the scale. Um, that clay, that clay band on the left there, in that little area of hollow, uh, is about five meters above sea level. It's about the same level as blue rocks. And uh, I think possibly that that area was, was sort of being preserved as sea retreated, and of course it all got eroded and weathered and stuff. And that formed the clay, and it's right there in that in that uh, hollow, shallow hollow, where the stream bed is still running through that. This sort of stream that runs through the shallow valley. Um, that clay, that shale ridge, I know because my house, uh, the foundations are put in shale, and and Barkman's place next door is also in shale. And all along St George's Avenue, those houses are on on the shale ridge. To to the seaside of there, they're all on sand, on on those those fossil sand dunes, which is quite common. Next. So currently, this is what we have. You know, we've got the Table Mountain Group sandstones at the back, all dipping, dipping to the north. We've got the we've got Buckerfeld shales forming this this uh, layer in between, which has been eroded along that Holocene uh, high stand cliff. Um, we've got the streams, we've got the shale ridge in there, the, the fossil dunes, and the and the current the current uh, current beach called Pig's Head on the right, which is your your Pliocene evidence and blue rocks, and at the mouth of the we've got the Holocene evidence. None of this has been done. This is just interpretation. That's what geologists do, and that's what I do in my, uh, in my brain or otherwise. Next, please. So, that's what I think of Nature's Valley Geology. I've spoken with, uh, with Henry Kutsia, who's the new director at, at the Nature's Valley Trust, and he's fascinated to to maybe try and get some students in there to do more incremental work on that sort of thing because it's so well exposed and just needs to be properly mapped at long. So we hope that that happens. But as I say, all the interpretation, we are coming. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, uh, questions? Yeah. Please. If anybody knows Nature's Valley has got more specific questions, sure. I'll be there in December. I can. Uh, yeah. Please, please, No specific question. No, no, not that I, I haven't, I haven't researched that in depth at all. I haven't researched that, no, but I mean, the age is like, I mean, to me, it's, it's, I can quite understand with you. Just looking at the rounding of the cobbles on that surface, these are all quartzite cobbles, as you know. 
And so many of the cobbles that you see on the beaches, like a pebble beach between Nature's Valley and Salt River, that's not current wave erosion. These have rolled down off that platform through the Pliocene onto the current and they've been reworked again. So that, I think that's a feature that indicates a long, long period. I'm just wondering if it could be all the rest of the Cretaceous one. Yeah. Is it? Oh, the Anakazirus. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Mike, uh, I don't know how well you know Needs Camp and what's happening around there. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's elevation so what higher than we now talk uh, of. Um, and you're absolutely right, that piece of our coastline needs attention to understand these heights. We always tend to refer to the Miocene as that high level that goes up to the Lundberg Mountains as well. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's very likely then fitting in there with its on the coast. Now to date it, there's no fossil evidence, uh, so you've got to really work it back to, uh, yes, how everything evolved. But what I want to ask you, John, is, um, is there any evidence of what we see closer to Paul Elizabeth, and that is the Algoa group, and this, uh, specifically uh, the unit at the base of the Algoa group, that's the Alexandria Formation, which when you spoke of it, when you mentioned the pebbles and the cobbles and those things, I sort of binged in my head in a way. Well, yeah. that's the thing. No, detailed work would probably be I mean, I'm sure there would be fossil material in those sediments, you know, finer grain sediments on those old river panels. And you know, you would then get, it, I guess, equating that to stuff around Niger. You know, it's all part of that sequence. So. I've got Brian Williamson wanting to ask, ask something. Brian, can you either type or ask your question? Yeah, hi. Hi. Good day, John. Sorry, uh, Bruce. Um, John, thank you very much. Wonderful. For those of us that are still uh, involved in the global stock markets, uh, we have to listen to a, a very different argument about climate change. And when I guess Al Gore and John Terry would be amazed that you didn't mention CO2. Can you give us a, a one or two line of how we reply to the likes of Al Gore and John Kerry? Just repeat the question before you answer it. Okay. Uh... Uh, that Bruce uh, Bruce Williamson. Williamson. He just uh, he's asking how we respond to the likes of Al Gore and John Kerry and, and CO two and CO two. Well, as you know, in this audience, we've had a couple of really interesting talks about carbon dioxide, and uh, there's a there's about six slides after this which are hidden, which just have images of what's happened with carbon carbon dioxide in the last five hundred million years, and it clearly shows that. That 500 million years ago, carbon dioxide levels were like 9,000 parts per million. There was no life that hadn't developed yet. But as life developed through to the Carboniferous, when all the coal beds were formed at the end of that, the carbon dioxide levels plummeted, plummeted down to dangerously low levels, almost much the same as we are now. So from an empirical point of view, that looks to me like... Uh, we know, our effect on, on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is probably infinitesimal compared to the whole cycle of natural carbon recovery, carbon destruction. And if you, I'm just actually gone back to reading a book, that, that story called The Martian, about the guy who was stranded on Mars and what he went through to balance his, his carbon dioxide and water and all the rest of it. And it's just very enlightening to understand
Hilton, sorry, you're muted. Oh. There's all been a play. <laughs> I mean, that was a long period of erosion between about, uh, well, between 550 million years when the granite was replaced to, to the base of the, of the, of the, uh, the Table Mountain sandstone, which was about 550. So in 50 to 100 million years, it cleaned off a lot of stuff, a lot of well, plain dirt. Um, a lot of our vineyards. Are planted on the slopes of table mountain sandstone. And they basically rotted granite. Some of them. How far does that extend? Well, that granite go all the way through to Paul, as you know, and up the eastern side of the Swatland. Basically, Paul Stellenbosch is all granite. And this way? This way, we get a few embayments of granite in the Himalayanada Valley. And at Stanford in the Klein River Valley, these are upfaulted blocks, a basement that were all part of the, the separation of Gondwana that actually uplifted this. And the Human and Arda Valley, the very, very nice correlation between different wine types and the different bedrocks. The shales in, in the Human and Arda proper, granite in the upper Human and Arda, shales and sandstone in the Human and Arda region. And they all provide their own characteristic things. And this is rather you know, fascinating. And the granites themselves, I mean, uh, the granites around Stellenbosch and so on, they provide this beautiful, and everywhere where granite weathers, you get a nice, a kind of a sandy, loose top, and then clay below, and that's where the water spreads. So the vines like to grow in the more sandy stuff, then the roots down in dry periods into the clay for water. And the more and more these wine makers recognize it, they're making use of it. No, thanks. Any, any more questions or comments? We were certainly going through a few aspects, ending up with wine now. <laughs> so, so to guys, you can you get a feel for what happens when we are these charges and uh, that process of thinking. And also, thanks, John, there for uh, bringing in carbon and sea level fluctuations and those things. But uh, I believe we're all invited to come and uh, experience what, what Nature Valley please, shows us. Please, yeah. uh, thank you for that because uh, it's a bit of a hidden gem in many ways. Yeah. Definitely for me. So Very John, exciting. Uh, number one, you've, you've, done a, you've done an amazing piece of geological work. Thank you for that because it, it opens uh, yeah, uh, the field for others to come and yeah. progress on that. Sure. So again, thank you for being what you are best, a geologist, knocking rocks, and answering, trying to answer questions. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.